Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name's Helen Martin. Um, I'm a maker and I'm also a senior lecturer at Falmouth University teaching uh, contemporary <coughs> crafts and I'm also, for my sins, um, uh, AHRC 3D3 PhD candidate. I'd like to talk to you today about a maker's mind, my, my mind, really. I decided to start where I left off. The last paper I delivered concluded with these words, I am what I make and I make what I am. A reflection of the world around me and like the millions of creative interpreters who have gone before me, I'm simply a conduit a visual communicator. I hope that by examining my creative process, you'll be able to understand the mind of this maker and engage with the notion of creativity as a multi-dimensional endeavour. As a maker, I find working across disciplines both challenging and exciting. I acknowledge the obvious differences, but have found it far more rewarding to look for the commonalities. It was almost 20 years ago whilst travelling through Romania with my brother, sitting in the closed carriage of a train, that I remember having a lengthy conversation about process. He's an engineer and I'm a craftsperson. We both make stuff. We spoke at length about the mirroring of process within our fields of work. Much to our surprise, we realised that we both present or are presented with a concept. We look to underpin this historically and culturally. We design and make or engineer and ultimately we reflect upon our final outcome and its effectiveness. We observed that more often his outcome provided specific function, whereas mine might require a somewhat different interpretation of function. <coughs> Perhaps similarities in nature and also in nurture seem to have given us more commonality than we might have predicted or perhaps there is just more general commonality in terms of process towards making. Uh, that is my brother and me, some years ago. Creative works are understood in a variety of ways and in order to unpack my process, I present an approximation of the creative cycle, a natural breakdown of a holistic process. Of course, parts of the cycle are interchangeable and reiterative to some extent. It is perhaps as part of the creative process that we problem solve and foster divergent ways of thinking. Being creative is frequently deemed to be somewhat special and an innate skill one might be born with rather than a process and a range of interactions used commonly and by all peoples across a very broad range of activities. Yule and Gilling argued that the journey of the creator might have nothing to do with having special gifts or unique mental capabilities. They recognised that in the main it has to do with hard work performed systematically through incremental steps of exploration and experimentation. They argue effectively for an emphasis on process rather than end result. The creative process is frequently exciting sometimes agonising, and I'm sure that uh, there are some people in the room who will recognise that, and yet ultimately rewarding and advancing. It is more fitting to describe a spiralling cycle, one that doesn't really have an end. We're continually learning through the course of making and through the process of living. There are points within the cycle where there's a birth of an idea, and certainly this offers the unique and entirely personal perspective of the maker. However, there's no magic, but possibly a kind of alchemy. My ideas really develop through two-dimensional explorations. I read, write, I sketch, photograph, make maquettes, often going back again and again to see which motifs pervade and demand to be made manifest. This is a strange but exciting part of the process. Inspiration can come at any time of the day or night and it pays to have a little sketchbook handy at all times. This is the point at which transition from input to output happens. This is the place where all information sits for a while, growing and metamorphosing. To place ideas in context is to substantiate these ideas. 
It's not only an essential way of underpinning, but promotes an expansive learning experience. Contextualization is not only based upon prior knowledge and experience, but it insists upon lifelong exploration. As an educator, encouraging the gradual development of a student's personal visual language is uppermost in my mind. It could be said that the birth of an idea and the way in which this is manifest is mediated through the lens of the maker. A concept, or more simply the ideas, are formulated gradually, not only as a result of data collecting, nor is the idea fully formed. The engagement persists throughout the cycle. At any stage, new information and material discoveries can change and develop concepts in new ways. However, it's not possible to come to this without considering the strength of that maker's identity. It is perhaps useful to employ the metaphor, as I frequently do, of the invisible backpack. This can contain all that you know, everything you've read, much of what you might have learned, and in particular, all that you've seen and experienced, so not much. We carry around the invisible backpack, adding to it daily. When one needs to manifest and express an idea, it's as though some of the contents are thrown out, sometimes violently mixed up together, literally thrown up. Consequently, when this occurs, the creative response or reaction is not necessarily straightforward to interpret, but it's as powerful a representation of the whole of that person, their culture, and their place in history as any verbal or written contribution. In acknowledgement of a personal visual language, I frequently witnessed a kind of eureka moment, the point at which any student might suddenly be aware that they only need ask themselves the right kind of questions, look at their lives and past experiences, rather than endlessly look to others as a source of inspiration. Here are just some of the contents of my own backpack, for example. Anyone born in the same decade as me will, uh, will surely have some resonance for. Sneaking into my work, whether I like it or not. Equally significant are key markers in time, enmeshed through smell, touch, and familiarity of material. It was Carl Knappett in 2005 that said, if we accept that mind and matter achieve codependency through the medium of bodily action, then it follows that ideas and attitudes, rather than occupying a separate domain from the material, actually find themselves inscribed in the object. Learning about materials and processes are central to any creative practice and considered to be vital in developing an ability to manifest ideas. However, in the main, this imparting of knowledge simply deals with those aspects of the learning experience that have been studied to the extent that we might predict with some certainty that if we do something in a particular way, we'll be able to achieve a specific outcome. We aim to foster a degree of control and familiarity with these core principles of making. However, in addition, we must contextualize, develop ideas, and most importantly, reflect both in and on action. Appropriate material selection is seldom as straightforward as one might imagine. Makers can select based upon suitability of material for function, availability, and through prior experience. Material selection based primarily through reliance upon tacit knowledge does sometimes have its limitations as it may only have one voice. Throughout history, the use and of course ownership of specific materials made into objects has indicated power, status, wealth, and is the foundation of economy. Each material resonates, speaks, and holds meaning and significance. Many artists consciously use material resonance in their work, of course. Perhaps one good example is by the minimalist sculpture Carl Andre, a work usually referred to as the bricks. The work comprises 120 fire bricks arranged in two layers in a six by 10 rectangle. Not only are each of these bricks of equivalent size, shape and volume to each other, but they also reference a commonplace building material in stark contrast to the high status materials such as marble, alabaster or bronze, more traditionally used in sculpture. The fire bricks resonate with familiarity, their origin, 
and their purpose in kiln construction. In addition, they speak of their manufacture and the process of mass production for construction and industrialization. Clearly though, meaning and significance do alter according to culture and from one individual to another. Nothing can be achieved without testing. It's impossible to move through the learning cycle without a degree of experimentation, both conceptually and materially. Learning through doing takes a long time, a great deal of time. In the last 15 years, as a lecturer, I've noticed a distinct change in the ability of craft students to accept this proposition. With a society that offers instant gratification at lightning speed, it takes some effort on my part to instill the importance of repetition of action and the power of failure. I will engage in the making process after a great deal of deliberation, sketching and talking, researching and material testing. For me, making is a wonderfully meditative engagement. I'm locked out of thinking much. I simply manifest my designs. Over a long period of time, I've developed a tacit understanding with clay and a good relationship with a range of other materials and processes. A strange kind of synesthesia can take place in the making. Whatever is happening at the time is quite frequently embedded within the work, like a time signature. Reflection is without question one of the most challenging yet vital aspects of my creative process. <coughs> Donald Schong, educationalist and author of The Reflective Practitioner, conceived of reflection in and on action. Reflection in action is perhaps best described as thinking on our feet. This type of formative reflection assists us in immediately structuring new approaches to move ahead differently, potentially accepting and or rejecting particular ideas through a process. The process of reflection in action can also be linked with reflection on action, which happens entirely after the event, so to speak. This is how we might ultimately develop a frame of reference, draw together certain theories, and bring fragments of recollections from the past into each moment. The development of critical awareness is central to the creative process. I manifest works driven from investigations into fundamental drives and needs, reproduction, consumption, and protection. In my making, I continue to focus upon the domestic, the repetition of use, the wonder and beauty of the vital tool, the meditation in the everyday task and the rhythm of doing. I often produce things alluding to function, purposefully fraudulent. I carefully select those visual elements which might imply a practical function However, in reality, the composition means that they cannot ever be effective for a domestic task. Now, I've been using gabbroic clay in my work for over 15 years. I choose to reference and emphasise the uniqueness of place through the archaeological and geological history of Cornwall. This work goes one step further in terms of site-specific material resonance. Tremo is the home of the combined universities of Cornwall, and was recently found to be a site of making as far back as the Neolithic period. I'm currently looking at reinterpreting archaeological material from this site. Between 2008 and 2011, excavations were undertaken by the Cornwall Archaeological Unit, revealing evidence of habitation since the Neolithic period. I create works directly linked to site, or it's perhaps more honest to say that I, the works I produce are site responsive. With the help of Dr Imogen Wood and staff at the Royal Cornwall Museum, I was able to source fine and courseware pieces of gabbroic pottery dug from the Tremo site. These 4,000 year old gabbroic clay shards were thin sectioned, mounted in resin and scanned at the highest magnification. At the heart of my recent investigation sits ChemScan a sophisticated machine providing automated mineralogy and petrography. Exeter University has one of only 61 existing ChemScan machines, and it turns out to be at Tremo. This scan gave me detailed data on the clay formulation, interesting in its makeup, 
It's a good refractory material, suitable to successfully withstand thermal shock, perhaps explaining the number of large-scale fines and the long-term successful use of this material in Cornwall and beyond. The scans also gave me vibrant imagery for digital <coughs> textile printing. After establishing the colourways, I digitally printed the imagery onto fabric. So this is the full length that I, that I managed to print out, and this is the, the print machine. So here's a highly pixelated close-up of the fabric and a key showing some of the data that I got from that. Sight over time. Giant five metre oven gloves. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny about that? I marvel at the perfect circularity of this ongoing investigation. I find it exciting that I am only now able to look at a shard in such microscopic detail as has ever been technologically possible. And who would imagine the machine enabling this magnification and detailed analysis would be situated directly on the site where the 4,000 year old shard was dug. The focus upon this abstracted gabbroic clay shard is intensified through magnification and compels your attention through exaggerated scale and focus upon the everyday object. However, my creative journey is far from a dry and analytical endeavour. In reality, for me, it is an innate process that has come into focus over many years, agonisingly time consuming and frequently riddled with anxiety. It's through examination of my own practice that I've been able to advise and encourage students to look with honesty at themselves in the manifesting of their visual language and to critically reflect upon the stages in their own creative process. My current interdisciplinary research is practice-led and examines and reinterprets further prehistoric finds from the Tremo site. I utilise new technologies in making and engage the digital in order to develop unique relationships between processes, materials and objects. I can see the notion of assemblage acting upon creative process, innovative and productive, when new knowledge emerges through fresh articulation of material, its qualities or properties, peppered through with historical and cultural um, investigation and practical engagement. I would therefore suggest a reconceptualization of the object as a complex arrangement of interactions. It's interesting to think of both object and person as performative assemblages, made up of a series of relationships and so I consider how people interpenetrate in their understanding of the past through objects produced in the present. Ever mindful that I interpret through my own lens. I am what I make and I make what I am. A reflection of the world around me and like the millions of creative interpreters who have gone before me, I'm simply a conduit, a visual communicator. Thank you.